Hey everyone, welcome to the weekly Paula's Choice live chat. I'm here, I'm back. I wasn't really gone all that long, but I'm a little wacky today. Um, Brian Barron, Director of Skincare Research, for those of you who are new to these chats. Um, my <clears throat> three and a half year old son woke me up at 4.30 in the morning crying that there was a spider on his pillow and therefore he could not go back to sleep in that bed. Um, I searched said bed, did not see the alleged spider, but nevertheless he was shaken up and spent the rest of the evening in my bed, um, which is good for him, not so good for me because he pretty much moves around like this. Uh, so at any given time you either get a heel or an elbow or a finger in your face. <laughs> uh, anyway, so I'm here today for the next hour to answer your skincare questions. Um, wanted to let you know that we are currently running, uh, I guess you could say it's kind of a stock up sale on paulschoice.com and that if you spend uh, up to $65, let me make sure I'm getting this right, uh, you get 15% off, 15% uh, off $65 or if you go $85 or above, it's 20% off. So. That's kind of cool. Definitely a good time to stock up on your favorites. Get that playing there. Okay. Uh, all right, everything's looking good. I'm assuming you guys can hear me because no one's saying I can't hear you. And you've got questions piling up. So um, one of the things I was hoping to discuss today, in addition to answering as many of these questions as I can get to, um, and my apologies, I haven't gone back to last week's chat to get to respond to questions. I'm sure there are some. I will do that. I promise. It's, it's been a crazy week and I was off on Friday and Monday and life. Um, but rest assured, I haven't forgotten. Um, I'd love to hear from y'all joining the chat today. Um, in terms, if you are, if you know our line, if you know Paula's Choice, you know, you've, uh, uh, what's that? The drank the Kool-Aid, that expression. Um, and you're a, you're a convert. Um, I would love to hear some of your insights on what you would like to see from us in terms of new products. We have various new products in the works, uh, including some that are going to be launching uh, through the remainder of 2018 and, of course, into 2019. We plan ahead. Um, but it's always good to hear. I think this live chat audience is is a bit of a different audience than than our customer base at large. You guys tend to be more of the diehards uh, and really are more uh, invested in Paula's Choice products in the Paula's Choice brand. So I would just love to get your feedback and you can just leave it as a comment. It doesn't have to be a, a, a question and uh, I'll look out for those as the chat progresses. So let's jump in. Uh, Nisi Pai N says, Brian, you mentioned at the beginning of the new weekly chats that you might do topics for these chats. Yes. <laughs> um, the topic this week can be what new products do you want to see from Paula's Choice? Um, but then she goes on to say, would love to hear, have a hair, hair topic chat one of these days. Those are always my favorites. I always learned so much and tried products that I ended up loving on your recommendations. Uh... Okay, so hair care. Um, first of all, I do think it's a good idea to try to stay on track and uh, have a topic of sorts for these chats. Ultimately though, um, I want these to benefit you guys who are tuning in, uh, especially those who tune in live and ask questions in the moment. Um, you know, cause you can ask me anything. And uh, if it's related to the topic that we discussed at the beginning of the hour, great, but it doesn't have to be. Regarding hair care though, I can certainly talk hair care. We can look at doing a hair care topic in the next few shows. What I'm not as adept at as I was back when um, we were doing videos in Seattle in our very, very tiny, literally, it was literally a closet. Um, <laughs> you couldn't tell from watching the videos, but the space was tight. Um, anyway. I, I'm, I'm not as uh, in tune to the hair care that's out there on the market right now. I know what I, I use and personally like because it works for my hair, but you know, it's very much like skincare. What works for my hair may not work for yours, especially if you have a different hair type and texture than me. Um, but general hair care questions related to uh, taking care of your hair, 
you know, shampoo, conditioner, do you need, do you need both? What's the difference between different types of styling products, hair loss, um, what's behind that, what you can do to treat it? That is a constant question from my mother. Um, she very much wants to believe that any hair care product claiming to stop hair loss uh, is going to work and I should take a picture of her bathroom cabinet because it is full of products that she no longer uses making those claims because they disappointed her and I've told her time and time again you need to start using minoxidil. It's really the only game in town right now. I wish there were more options. There just isn't. Um, anyway, there might be some tangents today you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Sonia says, hi, Brian, I have a couple of questions. One, how do you best suggest to apply the niacinamide booster? It's very watery, so it slips through my fingers and applying directly to face doesn't work either. It is a thinner textured product. Um, so what I do with, I don't use that booster very often, but uh, the C15, for example, has a similar texture. So I make a little cup with my non-dominant hand, and I'm a lefty, so I you know, take the dropper and pull up however much I need, and then I just dispense a few drops into my cupped hand, and then I use my clean fingers and put that on. Uh, the other thing that you could do uh, is you could apply it uh, like kind of like an old school aftershave uh, guys used to do. You just put a few drops in your hand, lightly rub them together, and then press or massage, don't pull or rub on, on your face and your neck, and you're done. Um, given that it is a liquid, you also have an option of putting it on a cotton ball or cotton pad. Um, I think that the fingertip recommendation, uh, that type, is, is the best. And I'm going to silence my phone because it's chiming. There we go. Sorry about that. Okay. Um... We covered that one. Sonia went on to say, I get big red bumps after laser hair removal. I think it's called folliculitis. I think you're right. Uh, what can I use for this? Um, generally, the 2% BHA liquid uh, from Paula's Choice or our Resist Pore Refining Treatment with 2% BHA or the Clear Regular Strength Anti-Redness Exfoliating Solution, all of those are liquids that contain 2% salicylic acid. So you're going to get really nice anti-inflammatory, a bit of antibacterial benefit, and some um, exfoliating benefit as well to help those bumps go away faster. Really, it's about that type of product and anything else that you uh, have on hand that would be soothing. Um, if it is, one more comment here, if it is, there are different types of folliculitis. Um, if it is related to bacteria, which probably not as likely with laser hair removal, but it could be. Um, the bacteria is certainly always there. Uh, you could also try a leave-on benzoyl peroxide product with at least 5% benzoyl peroxide. If those options don't work, the next step is to talk to your physician or pharmacist about a, uh, a topical prescription uh, antibacterial or uh, even an antifungal type product that may help. And you could layer all of those products at once if it's really bad. <sighs> yeah, Nisi Pai was helping Sonia out with her answer uh, about how to apply the niacinamide booster and she pretty much said the same thing I did. Um, I think I should have this person on as a, <laughs> as a guest host on weeks I can't do these chats. <laughs> I'm serious. Um, Zin Ring Feng says, hi Brian, could you talk about your options? On using ni talk about your maybe you mean my opinion on using nanoparticles in skincare products like nanosize TiO2 and zinc oxide and sunscreens and using nanoparticles as vehicle to deliver active ingredients. Uh, yes, I think that there are pros and cons to it, with the pros outweighing the cons. The major con being um, when you are nanosizing certain ingredients and you are not coating them to ensure that they stay on skin surface and don't really get past the uppermost layers. That is exactly what happens with nanoparticles of zinc oxide and titanium dioxide. Um, those are, if you're using nanoparticles of those ingredients in skincare, chances are pretty darn good it's in a sunscreen. So what you want from a sunscreen is 
cosmetic elegance. You don't want a mineral sunscreen or an in-part mineral sunscreen to go on thick and pasty and look kind of lavender, white, grayish on your skin when it sets. Nobody's going to wear sunscreen if walking around in it literally makes you look worse. And, and I've tried my fair share of them that do just that, and I don't wear them again. Um, I, I have to find something else. But if those... We know that those nanoparticles of titanium dioxide and zinc oxide are suspended in larger particles that don't get into the body, don't penetrate past the uppermost layers of skin, because sunscreen needs to stay there in order to work. So it's funny, I was just having this conversation with Paula like an hour ago. Um, if the nanoparticles got into the body, if they just sailed right past the surface of the, skin, of, of the skin, then when you use the mineral sunscreen and went out into the sun, or just even in regular daylight, you would get sun damage. You, you would see signs of a sunburn, signs of a tan, um, and that's typically not what happens as long as you're applying the, the sunscreen liberally and reapplying when you should, you know the drill. Um, in terms of nanoparticles of other bioactive ingredients, I think if it's something like vitamin C or retinol, I wouldn't be too concerned about those. Um, you know, it's, those are essentially nutrients. Uh, both of those ingredients are present in, in food. Uh, for example, vitamin A is retinol is present in most animal meat. Uh, so if you are a meat eater, steak, um, to some extent chicken, it's more, more the red meat side, uh, you're getting retinol in your food. You know, drink a glass of orange juice, you're getting vitamin C, or, you know, eat a cup of spinach, you're getting vitamin C. So nanoparticles of those ingredients getting into the body, there's really no cause for concern with vitamin C. Your body's going to excrete what it doesn't need. Um... And with vitamin A, because vitamin A is a fat-soluble vitamin, you will get some accumulation. The body stores it in fat until the vitamin is needed, and then it's moved out of that fat storage on an as-needed basis, and it goes to work. Um, there, you know, If you're eating a lot of vitamin A-rich foods, and or you're taking a multivitamin that gives you a higher-than-usual amount of vitamin A, and you're using, let's say, a body moisturizer with retinol, and the retinol is nano-sized, and therefore probably some of it getting into the body, that might be cause for concern in terms of pushing the limits of how much vitamin A you should really have in your body at one time. Uh, I think that's the rare person uh, that falls into that, uh, and I, I just don't think there's a wide selection of nano-sized retinol-type products on the market. For other ingredients that may be foreign to to the system. Um, I, I can hope, I don't know, no, no, I don't know this for a fact, but I can hope that the formulators know that they want these ingredients to stay within the uppermost layers of skin. Um, they're nano-sizing them so that they can penetrate into the skin a little bit further, but not necessarily get into the body itself. I, I'm, I'm hoping that that's the thinking that goes into such products. Um, and that they're taking a multi-level approach because, this is what I mean by multi-level, you don't want all of those bioactive ingredients that you put on your skin to sail right past and, and get into the deeper layers of skin. You need, you need some of those ingredients in all of the uppermost layers of skin, including some that stay on the surface. Uh, and the mole molecular sides uh, can be, typically can be manipulated to achieve that. Hyaluronic acid uh, is, is a great example. There's, there's different molecular weights of hyaluronic acid. Many brands incorporate the multiple weights we do, for example, in our hyaluronic acid booster, um, where the larger particles, the, the larger molecular weight, higher molecular weight stays on the surface. The medium goes a little deeper. The low molecular weight goes a bit deeper still. <clears throat> that was a very long answer, but I hope I answered your question uh, with all of my rambling. Aphrodite says, hi, Brian, I have very sensitive skin, rosacea, and in the past I've had severe acne for years. Uh, I would like to try the vitamin C booster, but I wonder if it will cause my acne. <clears throat> your thoughts? Um, I don't, I don't think it'll cause your acne. There's, there's, uh, there's n really nothing in it that would clog pores. Um, you could potentially, given your history, have an irritant contact dermatitis. Uh, which can result in red bumps uh, that can resemble acne. 
um, but it isn't true acne. The, the, if you were to look beneath the surface at the etiology of what caused that pimple to form, it's a different pathway, a different process than what causes an acne blemish to form. The acne blemish process can take a few weeks before you know the pimple starts lower in the skin and certain factors have to happen and it makes its way to the surface. So that's why when somebody says to me, well, I tried this product and I broke out overnight. Um, chances are it, either you have that breakout coming, it would have happened no matter what you used, uh, and that's acne, just rearing its ugly head, thank you very much, uh, or you're getting an irritant contact dermatitis that looks like acne, and they, it's very easy to see that type of reaction and think, oh my gosh, I broke out. Um, if I didn't know any better, that's exactly what I would say. You know, oh, this, this made me break out, this gave me acne. Um, but it's important to distinguish between the two because an irritant contact dermatitis uh, shows up very suddenly and uh, pretty much will continue as long as you keep using the product. When you stop using the product, the reaction subsides even if you don't use anti-acne products. Whereas if you have true acne and you do nothing to address it via skincare or via prescription options, it's only going to get worse. Uh, it, for the most part, acne doesn't go away without some form of intervention. You'll see a bigger pimple start to get smaller and whatnot, but you, you'll most likely be left with um, bumps under the skin or post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, aka post-breakout marks. Okay, so I, Aphrodite, I'd, I'd be a little concerned about using a high-strength vitamin C on sensitive rosacea prone skin. I don't think you have to worry about it in terms of acne. Um, what I would suggest, there's some great antioxidants in that product, chief among them vitamin C, and you can absolutely find research showing that vitamin C um, has some good anti-inflammatory effects. Um, however, the pH of that booster is around three, uh, which is necessary to keep the ascorbic acid stable in that amount. So you may get a little kickback from that. Um, all I can say is try it. There's, there's no like strong contraindication to not try it, but what I would suggest is just putting a small amount maybe on the side of your face here uh, and leaving it undisturbed for 24 hours or so and seeing how your skin responds. Try that patch test method before putting several drops all over your face. Liz Cox says, hi Brian. Uh, we're still trying to make the magic happened with Elena Anna PC. Do you be able to ask her for my email thread and see if you could do anything to assist, please? Happy to chat offline. Elena Anna PC. Yeah, let's chat offline, Liz. I'm kind of remembering that. I can email Elena N. Let me make a note. Do you guys still use post-it notes? Okay, hold on. Let me find a pen that works. There we go. Let's do that. I'll follow up with her, Liz. Arr, drop that pen. Okay. Uh, Elena says, hi, Brian. Sunscreen question. If I understand right, mineral sunscreen reflects the light, and this is how it protects. If I put on foundation on top of it, do I decrease the ability to do its job? So two, two answers here, Elena. Um, one, mineral sunscreens work both by absorbing and reflecting light. It's, it's actually a bit of a misunderstanding when you read that they only work by reflecting light because they, they actually do both. Um, they, there's some conversion of the UV light into harmless heat energy, which is how all of the other non-mineral sunscreen actives do it. Uh, and then there's a lot of reflection that happens. So it's not inaccurate to say that a mineral sunscreen is almost like a, a blanket for, for the face because it's, it's just, a I think, a better sense of cover-up in terms of sun damage than the other sunscreen actives. Um, I notice when I use mineral sunscreens, I, I definitely can go out in the sun and not see a color change to my skin. And when I use the non-mineral actives, even if it's a higher SPF, I'll typically see a bit of color change to my skin not a burn, it's doing its job protecting me from getting sunburned, um, but I'll still get some color change. 
So they, the minerals do it both ways, but definitely reflect more than they absorb. And your question about putting on foundation, does it decrease its ability to do its job? Um, if it's a foundation with sunscreen, no worries whatsoever. But even if it is a foundation that doesn't have sunscreen, the majority of sunscreen or the majority of foundations on the market, uh, whether they're liquid, cream, pressed powder, loose powder, so-called mineral makeup, they use titanium dioxide for its pigment. It's a pigment, uh, and it, it also uh, helps build coverage because it's a natural opacifying agent. Uh, so you can, it, it's multifunctional in makeup. So even if, even if the makeup you're wearing doesn't have an SPF rating, if it contains titanium dioxide, and you just have to check the label for that, even if it says may contain, if you have tan to fair skin, chances are whatever foundation shade works best for you naturally has some titanium dioxide in it. So there, you're getting some additional protection. <clears throat> what we don't know uh, is how much. There's, there's no SPF rating. Even if it has titanium dioxide, you shouldn't rely on that as your only sun protection because it's a just a guessing game as far as how much protection you're really getting. Jess says, or asks, I've heard that prescription grade retinol may not be healthy to use when pregnant or breastfeeding. I currently use Polytrate's clinical 1% retinol treatment. Should I discontinue that during pregnancy? Yes, you should. We are playing it safe there. Um, we've talked to different uh, OBGYNs, uh, pediatricians in the case of um, uh, lactating, if you opt to breastfeed your baby. Um, and it's ge generally a good idea to avoid any form of topical vitamin A when you're pregnant or breastfeeding. Um, you just don't want to get too much of it, uh, which, which can happen. I, I, think, I think it's being a bit overly cautious, but better safe than sorry. And I think you'll find that most physicians will, will agree, um, even if they may not have strong feelings about it. It's sort of like you know the, the precaution to avoid caffeine and alcohol. While you're pregnant, even though there's some research showing that both of those consumed in moderation, um, and they do define what moderation means, um, it's kind of dangerous <laughs> if we're left to our own devices to assume what moderation means. What I may think is moderating may be too much for another person. Um, but yeah, it's you know, my my sister is a nurse. She just had her third child. Um, she's you know she's healthy. The baby's the baby's healthy and well and growing and whatnot. She had a cup of coffee pretty much every day throughout her pregnancy. Um, I, and then I think in her third trimester, she would occasionally have like a half of a glass of wine uh, with, with dinner. But she really limited it, um, and she got her doctors okay. Uh, I don't know why I was going down that road, other than just saying um, there are... I wouldn't be... I wouldn't panic about using retinol or other vitamin A ingredients during pregnancy. Uh, if it's absolutely necessary for a skin concern you have, you'd want to discuss it with your doctor, but just generally speaking, it makes more sense to cut it out uh, just for a short period of time. Uh, CJ Magmer TV, what do you think of spearmint capsules for hormonal acne in terms of men? I have not heard of that. Spearmint. Um, first of all, pretty much all acne has a hormonal component. Um, people often will say, you know, hormonal acne or adult acne, and uh, there's really, in the literature, those terms will be referred to, but it's almost always in the sense of this is something that the lay person, meaning us, has come up with uh, to describe the type of uh, skin issue that they're experiencing. But really, there's a hormonal component behind almost every type of acne, and adult acne really isn't any different than teen acne. The common line there is that adult acne is caused by stress, um, which implies that teenagers aren't stressed or have nothing to be stressed about, or that even if they are stressed, that's somehow not a component of their acne. And it can be. It absolutely can be independent of your age. Um, the acne you have as an adult can potentially be more severe, than the acne you had as a teenager. Um, although that, for some reason that they haven't elucidated yet, um, when adult acne is more stubborn or cystic in nature, there's been a trend that I've seen in the research that 
adults who experience that type of acne tend to tended to have minimal to no breakouts during their teen years, whereas the teenagers that had pretty garden variety acne through adolescence, when they break out into adulthood, it's kind of minor, more of a more of a, a cosmetic nuisance than a you know, holy, holy moly, I've got a problem here. I need to go see a dermatologist. This is only getting worse type thing. Isn't that interesting? So spearmint capsules, I, I again, uh, uh, CJ Mag, Magmer TV. Um, I'm not familiar with, with what's going on there. I'm not aware of anything, uh, any of the components in spearmint being helpful for acne. Maybe some antibacterial action, but you're also giving your skin some volatile components. This I'm, I'm referring to topical application. I don't think there'd be anything valid behind ingesting spearmint capsules and, and acne. I mean, why not just chew spearmint gum? Um, but I, I can look into that a little further and see if there's anything to it, but I, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm skeptical. Uh, Mui Brianna says, hi Brian, what is your opinion on eth ethylated ascorbic acid? I think it's an interesting form of vitamin C. I do. That's the one uh, that Kiehl's uses. A few other brands use it. It's 3-O ethyl ascorbic acid. Um, it, there is research from the ingredient supplier. Not that that's necessarily a bad thing, but just keep that in mind. Uh, they're not going to publish research saying this new ingredient they developed sucks. <laughs> but there's, there's fairly well done studies showing that this form of vitamin C uh, has a very nice stability profile, and it's a bit more... It has greater versatility in formulas in terms of what you can mix it with, um, the different bases you can use, the different pH ranges, than straight up ascorbic acid. So I'm intrigued by it. It's a newer form of vitamin C. Uh, anything we can do to make ingredients more stable in and of themselves without having to take an unstable ingredient and then worry about stabilizing it in a given formula. That's what a lot of lines end up doing. Uh, including us for certain ingredients, and I'm not, it can be done, it's just more difficult. Alex says, uh, hola Brian, what can I use over my makeup without messing it up to A, retouch my sunscreen, and B, to hydrate my skin, which becomes a little dull by the afternoon? <clears throat> I, you know, if one of the, I don't have like a slam dunk solution here, but one of the things that you could try is to use an alcohol-based sunscreen spray. Now, some of you might be gasping because I don't normally recommend alcohol-based products, period. But when it comes to touching up your sunscreen and putting that on over makeup, there you have to keep in mind, with a layer of makeup on your skin, I'm not talking like thick theatrical makeup, but if you're doing a full face of makeup, you've got a layer going on, maybe more than one. Um, even if it doesn't feel heavy, when you put a sunscreen on top of that, that that's alcohol-based, and I'm talking like 78, 82% alcohol, um, that alcohol is going to evaporate before it can get through and damage your skin. Now, big difference then from doing something like that versus applying an alcohol-based sunscreen to bare skin, um, just on to cleanse skin. That I do not recommend. Um, the other advantage is that um, the amount of alcohol and the drier finish it leaves isn't going to break down your makeup, and especially not in a mist form. Now, if you were to take that much alcohol on a cotton pad and rub it over your face, yeah, it's a solvent. It's going to take off some makeup. But the hydrating part would actually come from the sunscreen actives. Um, many of those ingredients actually have a bit of a slick to oily feel and that's one of the reasons why they have to use a alcohol base uh, typically an alcohol base for a spray because otherwise those products go on too heavy um, so that would be my first suggestion you'd obviously hold it at arm's length um, try to do it inside or in a sheltered area versus like outside where the wind is going to take the sunscreen every which direction um, close your eyes close your mouth uh, don't breathe while you're spraying it and you're only spraying it for, you know, kind of like that, just a few seconds. But you don't want to get any in your eyes. You don't want to get any up your nose. Um, you know, so don't go <laughs> as you're spraying it. 
Uh, and, and let me know, I, I would much rather see you do something like that than use a makeup setting spray. Although I believe the Kula brand, the C-O-O-L-A, which you can get at most Sephora stores or Sephora.com and at Ulta stores, they have a makeup setting spray. I'm almost certain that has sunscreen in it. Very similar to the concept I was talking about. Uh, the advantage, I guess you could say, is that product is ostensibly formulated for use over makeup, whereas the average spray on sunscreen isn't. That doesn't mean that they can't work, but if you feel better about using a makeup setting spray that has sunscreen in it, that would be the way to go. Deca says, Hi Brian, would regular use of a setting spray be bad for skin? Ingredients are deionized water, uh, acrylate copolymer, SD40 alcohol, silicone and methyl silicate. Thanks a lot from France. Um, if you are using it over makeup, just pretty much what I just said, I, I wouldn't be too concerned about it. I would, I would want you to make sure that you are seeing results from this product. Um, most makeup setting sprays are, are kind of like hairspray uh, for the face in that they've got the alcohol. It got usually have a bit of a film forming agent. That's what the acrylate copolymer uh, helps to do. They have a, a suspending agent. Uh, which is the silylate ingredient. Looks like a fairly simple formula there. If you are applying it over makeup and not over bare skin, um, and if it's a makeup setting spray, right, um, I don't think you need to worry about it. But if you're not noticing results in terms of your makeup holding up better, lasting longer, I don't think you need to keep using a product like that. It's just kind of a waste of time if you find it's not doing what it's supposed to do. Okay, I have a couple of questions here from someone whose screen name is looks to be in Japanese characters, uh, which I, I don't read Japanese characters. Um, I'm sorry, but the question is in English. Okay, part one. Are antioxidants in skincare truly beneficial? Many dermatologists on YouTube and my own say they're unstable in skincare formulas and cannot truly benefit skin by fighting free radicals. Um, everything I've seen in how we use antioxidants um, absolutely indicates that they can work in products and, and that they will be stable if you use the right type of packaging. So perhaps <clears throat> these dermatologists are looking at the number of antioxidant creams or anti-aging wrinkle creams on the market. Antioxidants uh, should be and often are part of those formulas, but if it's in a jar, unless it's an airless jar, which would have a little disc and then you press down on the disc and it send some product up um, without exposing it to air. But a standard wide mouth jar uh, is, is absolutely, it's from the very first time you take that cap off, even if you replace the little disc, even if you recap tightly after every use, even if you store it in a cool dark place, that air exposure day after day is going to cause those antioxidants to break down. And it has a ripple effect through the formula. Um, there's also the hygiene issue, especially if it's a water-based product and you're dipping your finger into it. We can never get our fingers completely scrupulously clean. There's, there's always going to be some amount of bacteria that gets transferred into the product. If you are using one of the spatulas that the brand provided, um, it, that is another thing that you have to try to keep clean and it's tricky to do that. Um, you're still getting some cross-contamination there, probably not as much as using your finger, but it's still happening. Um, you know, dermatologists certainly have their opinions on, on skincare ingredient topics. Um, I, I would say there's just so much research on antioxidants in, in, in skin, and we know so much about how to use them in skincare, which ones work better in water soluble, which are oil soluble, and then how those two can complement each other. I, I just don't, there's just, there's just, uh, an overwhelming amount of research uh, showing that they have a benefit that I that if, if they don't then what else I mean yeah I could just go on it's like what what else in the products you know how would somebody how would somebody who's using an antioxidant loaded moisturizer and great packaging have better results than somebody who would be using the same type of formula without antioxidants. 
um, separate from the smoother, softer, hydrated type feeling, which you can get from ingredients that aren't antioxidants. I think over the long haul, you if you were to do a comparative study, you would see that the person using the antioxidant packed moisturizer, uh, all other things being equal in terms of you know daily habits, sun protection and whatnot, I think the person who's using the antioxidant moisturizer would end up having better looking, healthier looking, younger looking skin. I'm, I'm certainly, I mean, again, the derms on YouTube who are talking about this, if that's how they feel, that's how they feel. And then as, as consumers, we need to decide if we want to follow that advice, if it makes sense to us um, or, or not. And even if we weren't still all that clear on it, um, I, I would hedge my bets and still use products with antioxidants. I mean, it, why not? Is a bird says, hi, Bia. I wanted to mention that I used two tubes of the sunscreen in the orange packaging on my recent beach holidays, and it was amazing. Oh, you used our extra care non-greasy sunscreen. I can't believe I've never tried it before. Oh, that is an interesting product. Um, I get tan when I, I get tan when I use that one. Isn't that weird? I do not get a burn, and I love how it feels. Um, but because I generally I try to avoid seeing a color change on my skin, um, if I do wear that one in the sun, I tend to layer it with a mineral sunscreen. Um, that's something that I've started doing more and more of. Um, Beverly says the sale doesn't include new products. You are correct, but I think the only new product that would be if it's new within the last 60 days, so that would just be two or three products. Um, but yes, that I should have mentioned that earlier, Beverly. Thank you. Uh, Emily says, uh, is there a difference in efficiency between a leave-on BHA, AHA, and one that you rinse off? Oh, yes. Absolutely. Um, not, I'm generally not a big fan of rinse off AHA, BHAs, at least in, not in a cleanser form. I think they can have slight impact. Um, the other, the other thing is in terms of AHA, BHA being in a cleanser, um, which is the main type of rinse off product. I'll, I'll get to, uh, rinse off peels in just a moment. Um, that is, is two things. Um, cleansers typically aren't in contact with skin long enough for the AHA or BHA to really get in there and do its job. Um, even if you left it on for say five minutes, you don't want to you don't want to leave surfactants, cleansing agents, on your skin that long, even if they're mild, simply by virtue of how they work. Um, the other thing is that whether it's AHA or BHA, we know that in order for either of those ingredients to work as exfoliants, they need to be formulated in a fairly tight pH range. The pH of most facial cleansers is typically between five and a half and six. That is pretty far above the ideal pH range of three to four that AHA and BHA ingredients need. So you're getting much less potential exfoliation, a very brief contact with skin. It's kind of a why bother. Um, salicylic acid in a cleanser can exert a bit of calming action and perhaps even a bit of an antibacterial action. That is why we used it in our calm, not calm, clear, uh, normalizing, poor normalizing cleanser when we removed the triclosan because the triclosan uh, was in there originally for its antibacterial effect. That has become um, a controversial ingredient. We kind of wanted to get ahead of the controversy uh, and we just reformulated that cleanser. <clears throat> Peels. If you are using a higher strength AHA or BHA peel, Leaving something like that on skin for maybe 5 to 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes, that can be enough for those more potent formulas to get in there and get to work. But that is a different experience, and then you just rinse it off. Different experience, though, than using a facial-type cleanser, because, again, you would not want to leave cleansing ingredients on your skin that long. Um, Monica says, hand cream with SPF. <coughs> hand cream with SPF plus 30. I love the body butter formula and use it as a rich hand cream. I am a die hard convert and preach the PC mantra to all. Monica, thank you. Um, second of all, um, I have brought up a hand cream with sunscreen a lot. 
Um, I would love to see us do one. Um, I'm going to keep bringing it up. I, I do think we'll get there <laughs> someday. So uh, just know that, um, yeah, just know that it is being talked about. Um, I, I have nothing to say beyond that. It's, it's not something that we currently have in development, but I'd love to change that. Uh, hi, Brian. I'm 44 and concerned with wrinkles. This is from Elena. Around eyes, what kind of skincare routine would you recommend for eyes area? Well, it's I, I get what you're asking, Elena, but this is a, a good, a good uh, time for me to say when you think about a skincare routine, you should think about it for your entire face your neck, and also the chest area. Um, at Paula's Choice, we, in, in, in inside, we don't, this isn't public facing information, but we call it girls up skincare, um, with breasts being the girls. Um, <clears throat> there's a, another term that we could use too that is sometimes bandied about, but I don't use that one. I like girls up, but <clears throat> I figure if a woman says it, then, you know, she can own it. That's, that's, that's her body part. Um, so wrinkles around the eyes, that it's not that you necessarily need different products around the eyes than the rest of your face. Uh, I still maintain that that's true, even though we sell a couple of eye area products and, and I think that they're great and I use them here and there. The number one thing that you can do is protect the skin around your eyes from ongoing sun damage. And that, in, that involves using a broad spectrum sunscreen rated SPF 30 or greater you can find some eye creams with sunscreen. There are fewer and farther between. Uh, Clinique had one in their super defense line that I think they discontinued not too long ago, which was very sad because it was a good one, even though it was only SPF 20. <clears throat> um, sunglasses, you may not think of this one, but wearing sunglasses on a regular basis and make sure that they are marked, labeled, to provide uh, you uh, up to, I think it's 98%, maybe even 100% UV protection. You wanna see that on the little sticker before you purchase. Or if you're at a high-end boutique type place, ask them. Protecting your eyes from sun damage, uh, it, just, it, it takes more than just sunscreen. Um, the skin around your eyes, but then of course you've got the eyes themselves, which you're not going to put sunscreen in your eye. Uh, really, the only thing you can do in that regard, um, other than I think I think it may be these days that some contact lenses uh, provide some UV protection. But even then, the contact lens isn't going over your entire eyeball. So the point I'm trying to make is that wearing sunglasses regularly will not only help protect the skin around your eyes from further sun damage. You still want that sunscreen on the skin, but it will also help protect the eyes themselves and potentially spare you from dealing with cataracts, macular degeneration, and retinal degeneration as you get as you get older. <clears throat> um, if you have concerns about dryness around the eye area and that you feel that your eye area is drier than the rest of your face, then I think in that situation, an eye cream can be very beneficial. Um, we have one resist anti-aging eye cream. You can <clears throat> hop over to beautypedia.com and take a look at what the beauty te blah, 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 blah. beautypedia team recommends on their list of best eye creams and treatments for some other options. There's a lot of good ones out there. Um, you can use an AHA or BHA exfoliant up to the orbital bone area and then your your body heat will kind of cause those ingredients to move a bit closer. Just want to use caution using those um, exfoliating ingredients so close to the eye itself, which is why I say stop at the orbital bone. You can apply like to the upper eye area, but not the eyelid. Um, that along with uh, a retinol product or an antioxidant type serum, I think would be a good starter kit for the eye area. But then in terms of the serum in terms of the sunscreen, there's no reason to not apply that to the rest of your face, your neck, and your chest. Isabert says uh, that uh, she'd like travel sizes of everything and the barely there sheer tint back. Okay, noted. Uh, Liz Cox says I'd love to see some stem cell products. Margaret says, Consumer Reports is claiming that mineral sunscreens fail to perform up to their stated SPFs in their tests. 
Not sure how this is even possible if you're being applied correctly. Thoughts? You know, that, <clears throat> there, I, <laughs> this is a personal story. <clears throat> I used to subscribe to Consumer Reports and I let my subscription lapse because every time they do those darn sunscreen stories, I always disagreed with them. And I, I wasn't just disagreeing with them from a personal experience standpoint. I was disagreeing with them because that just isn't what the research has shown to be true. So I don't know. It, it's true that you like Europe has a different standard in the European Union for UVA protection than we do here in the States. And you need to, in order to claim broad spectrum protection for a sunscreen sold in Europe, you have to prove that the UVA protection alone is at least one third of the product's SPF rating. So a product that's rated SPF 10, sorry, 30, um, and which would be 30 for UVB, by this testing method and standards, the UVA screening alone would have to be at least SPF 10. So all of the Paula's Choice sunscreens that we sell over in Europe have, have passed that, I believe it's called a critical wavelength test. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't know if Consumer Reports isn't, isn't aware of that. I don't necessarily know how, how they're doing these tests, but I, I disagree with their, their conclusions on, on those products. And, and, and some of the, this is from years past, but um, I've heard from women who have used some of the sunscreens that rated highly by their testing methods. And they write us and they say, I, I bought this on Consumer Reports recommendation. I put it on 20 minutes before going outside. I, you know, basically, I, I did everything right and I got a burn. Um, how, how is this possible? How is something that got so highly rated causing these problems? For, and, and it, I don't know all the details there. there. There may have been some user error. Maybe they didn't reapply. Maybe they were sweating. I don't know all the details. But that's happened more than once over the years when people have followed the advice and consumer reports related to sunscreen. So it's, it kind of is disappointing. Um, I know that they mean well, but I think that these tests and the results that they sometimes get, which really conflict with what a lot of other research and anecdotal experience says, uh, it just confuses the matter. So anyway, that's my little story. Um, bottom line, my opinion here, um, I, I don't put a whole lot of stock in, in their test results for, for that category of product. I, I think that for other things that they do, automobiles, washing machines, whatnot, but sunscreens, ugh, you know, they've, they've worried about, they've warned about some other things related to skincare and ingredients that um, just hasn't been shown to be true or the research was misinterpreted um, and later debunked and then I would never see them print a correction. Ugh. Anyway. Oh, let's see, who haven't we taken a question from? Because we've got about nine minutes left. JVL says, I was wondering, since using multiple steps, even up to 10 in your skincare has become popular, if you can actually, if you actually can overhydrate your skin and how can this affect your skin? Um, that's a, that is a good question. If you're layering thinner textured products, I don't think it's as much of a concern. Um, and you're not, when you're applying a lot of different products at once, leave on products, and for most such products, you know, like essences, treatments, serums, or boosters, it doesn't take a lot. Um, these are, aren't products like sunscreen that you need to slather on, or even like a body cream. You know, if you've got really dry skin, chances are you don't want to be skimpy with your body lotion. Um, I haven't seen any research indicating that that's a problem. We know it's a problem when skin takes on too much water, but in... I haven't, like for example, I haven't seen research showing that it's a problem if skin takes on too much glycerin or too much hyaluronic acid or too much of a glycol. Um, and the water in those products, uh, a lot of it, the longer it's on the skin, that water actually goes away. And it's, it's the um, non-aqueous ingredients, so to speak, uh, that, that stay behind. And I don't see layering those uh, being a problem in terms of overhydrating the skin. Um, 
And from personal experience and from what I've heard from people over the years, I can't think of a single instance where I've talked to a woman or man about skincare and, and they said, yeah, I think I'm just over hydrating. I think I'm just doing too much hydration. Um, not saying it is impossible. I just don't think it's likely. All right. Kareen says, hi, I use C15 booster and hydroquinone treatment. My skin has turned red where I apply. I use all the calm cleanser, toner, moisturizer, but has not reduced the redness caused any recommendations. Well, here we have a situation where it could be either one of those products that you're sensitive to. It could also be the combination. Um, I, I would suggest, I think that of those two, the more likely culprit would be the C15 um, because of its pH and because it's just a more active product. Um, and hydroquinone typically isn't known to cause redness. Um, however, um, we have two hydroquinone products. We've got the Triple Action Dark Spot Eraser, which is a lotion, and the Triple Action Dark Spot Eraser Gel, uh, which has the gel has salicylic acid along with the hydroquinone, and the lotion has glycolic acid. So it's possible that, let's say you're using the lotion, it's possible that the glycolic acid in the lotion uh, is complicating matters for you. Uh, maybe you're already using another exfoliant and it's just too much. I would suggest uh, pulling, if, if you <clears throat> haven't stopped using either product, stop the C15 first and continue applying the hydroquinone just to the dark spots and uh, see if the reaction continues. If you have already stopped using both products, now you're using the Calm products and the redness is still there. Um, it, it sometimes, depending on the extent of the reaction, uh, and it can be an individual response, I know it's frustrating. Um, it can take some time for it to go away. You can help it by, uh, I, you could certainly talk to a pharmacist or just go to a drugstore and buy a tube of over-the-counter hydrocortisone cream at a 1% concentration. You don't have to get a name brand. Most major drugstores have their own brand. What you want in this case is the active ingredient. The, the base it's in um, typically doesn't matter. Majority of them are fragrance-free. Do check though to make sure there's no fragrance on the label because fragrance is, uh, that's not going to do the red areas any favors. And, and let me know, um, and certainly reach out, Kareen, to our client services team uh, and have them help you troubleshoot a bit further um, where you guys can have a, a more specific dialogue than, than I can do in the, in the guise of this live chat. Because I want, I want you to get to the bottom of this, uh, and I want you to be happy with the products you end up using from us. So Kevin is asking, what's the best Paula's Choice products for seborrheic dermatitis? And seborrheic dermatitis is a skin condition that is generally believed to be caused by different strains of yeast. And it can involve um, X areas where there's excess oil along with yellowish, dry, flaky patches. Um, on the scalp, seborrheic dermatitis is more commonly known as dandruff. And we do not market any of our products as specifically being for this condition. However, the scaliness that accompanies this problem can be minimized by using a BHA exfoliant once or twice daily. Uh, if you're new to them, I would suggest either the Calm 1%, uh, 1 BHA lotion or the 2% BHA liquid from our Skin Perfecting line, which you can just dab on to the affected areas. I would encourage you though, if you're not already using a leave-on exfoliant to put it all over your face because they're just so beneficial, you'll, you'll never look back. Um, otherwise, <clears throat> there are various topical prescription products you can use to control the symptoms of seborrheic dermatitis. Unfortunately, at least last I checked, it isn't something that you can get rid of permanently. It's something uh, that you just have to manage. Um, and if you do keep it under control, in most cases it won't get worse, so that's positive. There is a product that I'm aware of that is still sold, because I just checked this recently, it's called Derma Zinc, Z-I-N-C, as in the mineral zinc, and the active ingredient in this product is zinc pyrithione at about a quarter of a percent. 
This is the only topical product I'm aware of that contains this antifungal ingredient, antifungal, anti-yeast. They're usually, those types of ingredients tend to be used synonymously um, in both types of products. So check that out. Um, I've recommended it to a few people over the years who've had seborrheic dermatitis, and I think all but one of them had really, really great results with it. Um, so give that a try. Zinc pyrithione is the active ingredient in most anti-dandruff shampoos. Well, not most, because there's a couple others. Um, but if that doesn't work, Kevin, uh, after a few weeks, and you're also trying my uh, salicylic acid exfoliant idea, then I would talk to your dermatologist about topical prescription options. Um, those same, that same group of anti-yeast, anti-fungal medications, uh, you can get those in different compound mixtures from a pharmacist that would give you a greater amount of the active ingredient, which some stubborn cases of seborrheic dermatitis need. <sighs> All right, let's do one more. Foodie in college. Hi, Brian. Do you think applying sunscreen at night is a good option if your blinds don't really close? I'm going on vacation really soon, and I know that hotel blinds are usually awful. I haven't found that to be the case. Maybe I'm staying in nice, really nice hotels. Um, you know, the other thing that I noticed that most hotels don't have anymore are our blinds. They, they have um, curtains, typically heavily lined curtains to block out the light. However, if you do find yourself in a room that has blinds and they don't close all the way, um, given that we're talking about a vacation, so a, a finite period of time, maybe a week or so, I don't think it's a problem applying sunscreen at night. Um, I wouldn't encourage that for most people simply because it's not protection that's needed at night. But in situations like this, I, yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I think it's great that you're being so um, sun conscious. I mean, you know, someone's going to look young. All right. We are at the end of the hour. So I'm going to bid you a fond farewell. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for your product suggestions, and I will be back uh, next week, but I will be doing this from Seattle. I will be in the Seattle office, and when is that scheduled? Is it still going to be on Thursday? Yeah, okay. So same time, same bat channel next Thursday, but it will be from our Seattle office. Um, so I will talk with you then, and I'll come back and answer questions in the comments section.